So thank you everyone for um, having me speak. So I just sort of want to give a quick um, overview about uh, what I'm going what I'm going to talk about and what the structure of these talks is going to be. So, um, so what I'm describing is joint work with uh, a uh, a large group of you know collaborators: Rinkin, Gates, Gorey, Kashjan, Rosenblum, Bartowski. I'll say that once and for all, and then <laughs> never again. Um, and uh, yeah, and so me, uh, Nick Rosenblum, and Dennis Gates Gorey are going to give a series of, of uh, three talks. And uh, maybe before I really get into it, well, I'm, I'm hoping I, I have the feeling I have a little bit of extra time. And so I'll, I'll try to go slowly. <clears throat> but I just sort of, uh, I guess, want to give a, a big picture view on the, um, on the program. And so let me start with some. Uh, kind of motivation, um, which is about, uh, well, so there are kind of different ways to state the motivation, but uh, one of them is that the, how should I say this exactly? So the usual Langlands conjectures, uh, They call out for some improvement. Um, so it, it's it's not that the Langland, I'm not trying to say that the Langlands conjectures are wrong or something like this. It's just that there's <clears throat> there are some features of them that are uh, unsatisfying. And what uh, we're going to explain in the course of these talks is how to uh, how to um, formulate a, a happier version of the Langlands conjectures in a special case. So, uh, so our setting, um, so I'll say our setting is going to be uh, unramified automorphic forms. So this is a technical phrase, but then I'll say more about what it means in a second. Um, unramified automorphic forms for function fields. So uh, let me work in the following context. So I'm going to work over, I'm going to take x naught over fq to be a smooth. So fq is the finite field. This will be a smooth um, projective, uh, I guess, geometrically connected. Um, so just connected in a natural sense, um, algebraic curve. Um, I'll take x over fq bar, um, which I'm going to call little k. Uh, it's you know just extend coefficients, um, and usually I'm going to kind of ignore the difference between x zero and x. So most of my algebraic geometry will take place over this field, but I should remember that everything is defined over the finite field originally, um, and uh, and so. The, and in, I'm going to take G to be a split reductive group. Um, so it could, for example, be um, GLN. And I'm going to take G check um, considered over QL bar to be its Langland stool group. Um, which in this case would be also GLN. Uh, it's, although they are equal in this somehow most interesting case, it's kind of uh, a good idea to distinguish them. For instance, I consider them as over a different field. So here I'll consider G is over K or over FQ um, and G check is defined. So in particular, it's defined over a characteristic P field. Here, I'm gonna take uh, G check to be defined over a characteristic zero field, um, Q bar. <clears throat> um, and so, um, I'm going to take bun G, the space to be the stack of um, G bundles on X. X not. Um, so, for example, uh, again, if G is GLN, uh, these are vector bundles. So I consider arbitrary vector bundles, not just uh, stable or semi stable ones. And so then in that context, it's uh, important to work with stacks. And uh, 
Yeah, and in the case of GL1, this is some version of um, the Jacobian. I, I allow line bundles that aren't just degree zero, and I consider it as a stack, so there's some automorphisms around, but otherwise it's um, sort of built out of the Jacobian. And uh, the uh, usual Langlands conjectures in the setting um, describe what are called automorphic forms. So I'm going to say, um, I'll write this. So automorphic forms, and I'll write a C to mean compactly supported ones. So this is going to be the set of compactly supported functions. On um, fun G of FQ, uh, where I can remind that uh, in this case, fun G of FQ, it has an adelic description for people um, who know. So it's, it's kind of double quotient. Um, uh, and specifically, Well, specifically, it gets hard. So for instance, um, if G is GLN and I consider cusp forms, um, so uh, then it predicts that uh, this data uh, should be the same as, as um, irreducible and dimensional. Sorry, not this data. I should say um, Hecke eigenforms. inside of the space. So eigenfunctions for certain computing operators that uh, I don't uh, want to recall at the moment should be the same as irreducible and dimensional uh, representations of the Lingland's dual, well, of the Galois group, the Vey group, I should say. So you're supposed to take the Vey group of this field FQ of X. Um, so I should say this. Uh, so it's the same as just the certain maps like this, which you think of as the group G check here. So this is kind of a, a statement that seems to make sense for general G, but in fact, it gets very um, complicated for more general G. So uh, kind of more technical for general G. Um, I start to run into L packets and things of this flavor. <clears throat> And let me just note kind of one. So what we're looking at here, again, are we're looking at certain special functions. You should think, you know, almost like, um, uh, like exponential functions on uh, in the kind of complex analytic setting um, or nth power maps on a circle maybe is a better way to say it. So, uh, so just certain kind of very special functions. And these are given some kind of uh, parameterization in terms of uh, data for a kind of dual group. So I just sort of want to set up <clears throat> um, a kind of analogy here, which is that um, usual Langlands um, is kind of analogous to the statement that the set of characters of S1 um, is equal to Z. So it's a kind of bijection like this, um, but sort of true Fourier theory um, on the right-hand side You know, what it really should say is something like L2 of Z is equal to L2 of S1. So it describes not just, so to say, like a bijection between certain individual functions, which is the nature of this um, conjecture, but it describes the whole space of functions. Um, and there's <clears throat> a kind of problem, which is to really describe um, the space of automorphic forms uh, in terms of of this Langlands dual group, G check. <clears throat> um, and this should be, so to say, like generalizing Langlands as conjectures. So this is a problem that uh, makes sense in a broad setting, certainly global fields and, uh, and general automorphic forms. What, what we're going to describe over the, the course of these talks is going to be a solution to this problem um, in the special case under consideration here, unramified automorphic forms and uh, and uh, function fields, certainly. 
Um, so there's a kind of uh, inspiration that you can take for this problem. Um, <clears throat> maybe I can pause for questions for a second. Are there any? Okay. Um, so there's a kind of uh, inspiration that you can take here, which is that the, the uh, geometric Langlands conjectures of um, Valence and Drinfeld, um, these, these assert, well, these, these have the flavor of what we want. So, uh, but like in a different setting. Actually, one quick question mm -hmm. is, are you saying there's some like general formulation of the Langlands conjectures that includes Fourier theory as a special case? Uh, I mean, uh, am I certain that, so certainly I don't want to say anything about. Um, that would be neat, but I, I, I don't know if that's it. Yeah, so let me, um, you, can, you can say something that's not, well, basically what I'll explain in the case of, of um, so, okay, let's ignore L, L2, maybe take compactly supported functions over here. So then over on the other side, uh, what you're seeing are functions that can be expressed as um, Laurent series. And if you sort of take what we're saying here in the case of GM, and the curve being P1, you'll end up with that kind of uh, bijection. Um, and there's a one one of the problems here would be to really say this for L2 um, properly, but um, yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a sense in which the statement is kind of so trivial that everything it's you know a bijection between two vector spaces with two bases. But yeah, that is the the flavor of um, sort of unramified class field theory for P1. Um, where did I put my first sheet of paper? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, just also let me know if I start writing somewhere illegible or you want to see something on the screen. I have some practice in this, but I'm not uh, a master of it yet. Um, Okay, so uh, so let me just give a reminder on that setting. So there, um, we take k to be a field of characteristic zero, so hence incompatible. Um, we take x to be the same, um, and there's a kind of reminder, um, which is that <clears throat> um, if y over k is a is a maybe algebraic stack, um, then there's an analogy. That there's a certain category called the category of D modules on Y, and it's kind of um, supposed to be analogous. So you should think functions on the space of FQ points, maybe of Y, whatever that is supposed to mean. Um, <clears throat> so if you imagine Y is defined over both FQ and K, then well, this is a kind of analogy. Um, D modules, I, I don't want to say a ton about them. They're not the emphasis of this talk, but uh, very briefly, they include things like uh, vector bundles with flat connections. And more generally, I don't require my, um, my sheaves to be vector bundles. They can be more general kind of quasi-coherent sheaves with an action of vector fields um, and satisfying the usual flatness condition. Um, so, uh, so the conjecture, well, maybe I'll introduce one other object here. Uh, maybe I'll hold off for a second. So the conjecture of um, Balance and Drinfeld, and this is sort of after, well, okay, I should maybe say it the other way. So in the form of a Rankin Gates glory, um, which made more precise the original um, idea, um, states that the category of D modules on the space of Bun G, which here is analogous to the space of unramified automorphic forms that we looked at before, is equivalent to 
the category of what's called incoherent sheaves with nilpotent singular support in the space locus G check, where there's a couple things to say here. Um, so, uh, so on the right hand side, uh, so the first kind of most important thing that appears is the space locus G check. Um, and this is going to be the moduli space of Durham um, G check local systems um, on X. So for example, um, if G check is equal to GLN, um, this is the moduli space of vector bundles with flat connection. Um, so for instance, there's a forgetful map down to um, bun G check. These are G check bundles with extra structure. Um, and, uh, and then there's a second thing, which is that uh, this category int code nope, I sort of don't want you to worry about too much. This is not the emphasis. Um, uh, it's a sort of uh, refinement of um, what's called quasi co quasi coherent sheaves. Uh, I should say everything here, uh, these are all derived categories. So um, this is, all of these are considered as um, categories. Uh, uh, okay, so it's like not the, not the emphasis of this talk. I just sort of want to have the notation around and um, it's possible to speak precisely, but um, it's not sort of the thrust of what we're after here. Uh, so there are some, well, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so there's no uh, statement about uh, eigen, uh, Hecke eigen and uh, Hecke operators in this conjecture? So, uh, yeah, so I should say this conjecture maybe, um, so this conjecture should preserve many structures. Um, so, uh, so one, which will be discussed more, uh, uh, is the action of Hecke operators. So I can just kind of, um, quickly comment on this. So, uh, if you're given a point inside of this curve, um, then, uh, geometric Sataki, uh, gives rise to a, an action of the category of representations of this dual group on the category of D modules on Bungie. Um, the Hecke action. Um, and as we'll discuss later, uh, it's possible to allow the points to sort of vary. It's possible to allow uh, multiple points to appear and this will be um, important structure in, in the future talks. But let me just kind of take it in this simple form for a second. Um, so the first thing is that there's this construction on, on the so-called, I mean, on the sort of automorphic side. And on the other hand, uh, if you take the same point X and X, uh, then you get a sort of restriction map from these G check local systems, I should say on X um, to uh, the space of local systems on the disk at X. Um, so the formal completion of the curve at this point. Um, and well, a formal, a formal disk certainly is simply connected. And so this is just a copy of the stack um, point mod G check. And so that gives rise to a tensor functor from ref G check to quasi co of locus G check, um, which acts on this category int co. Um, and this should should correspond under the um, under the equivalence. I, I should say this is um, your quasi co of point mod G check. Um, and so that's going to give you a, a matching of things like um, th that, I mean, that allows you to describe Hecke eigenfunctions over here in very precise terms. So, uh, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, sorry, Hecke eigen sheaves, I should say. Um, is there a geometric construction of these uh, Hecke operators on the DMOD site as correspondences? 
so they're not literal correspondences. They, uh, they're what people sometimes call cohomo cohomological correspondences. So you need to sort of take a current, like you could do sort of push pull using a correspondence, but you could also pull tensor with some sheaf and then push forward. And what you'll see are um, that you need to tensor with certain sheaves, namely, well, essentially they come from intersection cohomology um, sheaves on the FN Grassmannian. <laughs> um, but yeah, everything is, is very uh, certainly geometric on this side. Um, yeah, so, so uh, but again, what I want to emphasize here is that the nature of this equivalence is not just about Hecke eigensheaves. It's really about the whole space of D modules, and therefore it's about um, the, like, and it also involves this moduli space, Lopsis um, G check. And, uh, and, and therefore, I should say it's analogous to kind of the good version of Fourier theory. <clears throat> um, okay. So, um, so now I want to uh, sort of say some, well, Kind of the goal for today is to um, give a version of these geometric Langlands conjectures that make sense um, over any field. Um, and uh, for any sheaf theory. Um, so there's a sort of kind of key example of sheaves I'll have in mind just for sake of definiteness. Um, um, I'm going to work over um, K algebraically closed of arbitrary characteristic. Um, and I'm going to take uh, sheaves uh, on you know, a variety or stack or something to be, by definition, the derived category of um, end constructible Um, QL bar sheaves. Uh, and I should say also that uh, I guess L is invertible in K. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, so what are the uh, problems with, with uh, doing this just um, at the beginning? So, um, so let me just bring back for a second. So, in the original balance and Drinfeld conjecture, there's this whole category of D modules and this sort of moduli space of G-check local systems. So the first problem is that there's not really um, an analog of, of um, the whole category of D modules. So what you would sort of what's analogous to these constructible QL bar sheaves are what are called holonomic D modules, which is a hugely restrictive condition. And geometric Langlands conjecture, it doesn't describe uh, holonomic D modules, it describes all D modules. Um, and so one thing we get, I guess, as a consequence of our work is a version of geometric Langlands specialized to holonomic, um, well, to certain holonomic D modules, we'll see. Um, and the, uh, this, the second sort of, I wanna say in some sense more major problem um, is that the space of Luxus G check of G check local systems looks like nonsense in the L-adic setting. Like uh, it doesn't seem to make sense. <clears throat> yeah, I guess maybe at this point I can say uh, a little bit about what the structure of these talks is going to be. So uh, the goal for today is to give a version of geometric Langlands conjectures that makes sense, for instance, in, in the setting and then uh, so at least, you know, we sort of solved, so there's maybe two problems <laughs> that are that the uh, Balance and Drinfeld conjectures are not the conjectures Langlands thought about. The first is that they're over fields of characteristic zero just from the start. Um, and they're about, yeah. And the second is that they're about categories and not about, uh, you know, spaces of automorphic functions. And so what I'm gonna describe today is just solving that first problem. So giving a version of Langlands conjectures that, uh, doesn't uh, 
Uh, could I say more about what doesn't make sense mean? Uh, wait, I feel like I have said that phrase a lot. So when did I say it last? Uh, so, uh, well, so, so th this valence and Drinfeld conjecture, usually it's about um, this category of D modules, it, it's something that is only really well behaved. I mean, maybe you can say something, but it's really kind of specialized to the situation of, of, um, of characteristic zero fields, a lot of the good behavior. Um, and the work that's been done in the area certainly uh, has focused on the characteristic zero situation. Somehow more seriously, what people know is that Oh, and look, yes, that I will say more about. I, I'm seriously going to say more about it. Uh, this is just a digression to say what the structure of the talks will be. Um, so, sorry, I didn't understand. So the, uh, so the, the, there's, there's two issues. One is that valence and Drinfeld is about D modules, not about l adic sheaves. Um, it's not about characteristic P. And the second issue is that, um, is that it's about categories, it's not about uh, functions. And so what I'm going to talk about today is the geometric Lindgren's conjectures for l adic sheaves. And then Nick and Dennis will start to talk about how you extract uh, statements about functions, conjectures about functions uh, from, uh, from this conjecture. So um, our, our work predicts a very precise and satisfying description of unramified automorphic forms um, and contingent on this geometric Lindgren's conjecture I'll state today. Um, Okay, so uh, the space locus G check doesn't seem to make sense. So let me just sort of give a an example of its of how its uh, geometry is very nice. So if G check is equal to G M, then uh, it looks as follows. Sorry. So there's a forgetful map down to uh, the card. So let me just basically write Jacobian um, of X. Well, and then there's some factor of the stack point mod G M. Um, so every local system, every line bundle with connection has degree zero. Um, and this is sort of in the, I should say, in the DROM setting. Um, and the fiber of this map is the space of global one forms on the curve, thought of as an affine space. So this is some short exact sequence of, of stacks. And so what you get is an extension of an abelian variety by uh, some big affine space. And this is somehow, it's a, uh, very typical of, of what, um, what happens in this Durham situation. So for instance, you can imagine fixing your G bundle and varying the connection uh, to give yourself some sort of move, room to move around in the geometry of, of the space of local systems. Um, or you can imagine varying your line bundle, but all of that, you know, it's clearly uh, very specialized to the case of, of, um, of line bundles with connection. So this kind of nice moduli space, it only exists in that situation. Um, and what you'll see is that, you know, if you think a little bit, if you have kind of two different rank one local systems in the l adic setting on a, on a curve, there's not any way to deform one to the other. <clears throat> um, so there's kind of no way to deform, um, you know, one rank one local system to another um, in the Aladic setting. Um, <clears throat> and so one of the kind of uh, main ideas of our work, um, so sort of a, a main idea um, of our work is the introduction so it kind of, you know, in some sense, these two failures are related to each other, I should say, that the space of local systems doesn't make sense. And the fact that the left-hand side, this big category of D modules also doesn't make sense. We'll see. So uh, what we'll see is the introduction of a moduli space um, that parameterizes. Um, so first of all, I should say where this lives. It's, in our setting, it's going to live over QL bar. Um, so different from the rest of the algebraic geometry we're considering here. Um, and so the introduction of a moduli space that, um, that uh, is appropriate for, for um, 
our problem. Um, so it's going to be called restricted local systems. Uh, uh, the sort of long name is that there are local systems with restricted variation. It's going to mean exactly stuff, as I'll explain, like you can't just deform one rank one local system to another. So here's the um, definition. So um, suppose um, S is an affine scheme um, over um, this field QL bar. So I'm going to define the space of restricted local systems by defining maps to it. So a map from S to locus G check restricted is the data of um, a symmetric monoidal functor um, this category of representations of G check. So um, to um, something I'll write down in a second. Uh, I should say that is um, right T exact. Uh, so this is something kind of to ignore. It's related to the fact that we deal with derived categories. So here, well, up to minor technical issue, I'm just going to ignore today. Um, this is the subcategory of um, complexes um, with these cohomologies, so sort of local system. Um, and this tensor product is, uh, it's a sort of categorical tensor product that maybe not everyone knows. So just uh, if, let me just say kind of explicitly, um, if, if S is equal to spec A, um, then this category on the right-hand side, these of X, tensor quasi equal of S is just the category of A modules in the world of, of um, these least sheaves. So in other words, it's a least sheaf or really these are big objects. So it's an end least sheaf with, um, with just an action by endomorphisms of this algebra A. Um, <clears throat> so uh, here, everything is derived, and so this is really an object of um, derived algebraic geometry, I should say. Um, so everything um, is derived, um, including, um, so to say, this object. In other words, it lives as an object of derived algebraic geometry, which is a known thing from the DROM setting that um, that, that sometimes happens and is the better situation to work in. So maybe uh, I can, oh, and let me just say, uh, I guess again, so kind of motivation um, is that um, in the Durham setting, um, a map from S to local to check is exactly equivalent to um, a right T exact symmetric monoidal functor um, from uh, refugee check to um, quasi code of S. Oops, I got the order wrong. Tensor G module one X. Um, uh, Sam, could I ask a question? Yeah. The least sheaves here are QL bar sheaves, right? Yeah. But it's possible, but A is now some characteristic P of FP algebra or something. Oh, sorry, no. Oh, no, no, it's over QL bar. I see. Yeah. Okay. Right, so in this story, geometry happens over two different fields. Okay, yeah. So there's sort of like the field with like G bundles and so on. Um, and that's this, you know, maybe characteristic P field. And then there's also this field um, QL bar that's around the sort of field of coefficients. And that's where our local systems live. That's where all our derived categories live. Um, yeah. Sure, thanks, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a confusing part of the story. Um, and somehow, similarly, I never need derived algebraic geometry over FQ. I only sort of need it over QL bar. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, and I guess I should say maybe just um, if, for instance, you take S to be a point, 
So this is just a symmetric monoidal functor like this. And, uh, and that's, well, it's kind of standard that that's the same thing as the local system. Right. Just check local system. And this is just some refinement of that picture. By point, so I want to. Sorry, by point, you mean S equals spec QL bar, right? Well, I was thinking in the drum situation, but yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, point, point spec QL bar, spec K, whatever, whatever uh, is appropriate. Sort of spec of the coefficient field. So in the Durham situation, yeah, everything happens over the same characteristic zero field because Durham cohomology it has the same coefficients as as the ground field, um, but in our situation, there's these two fields around. So I'm going to describe the geometry of the space uh, in more detail in, in just a moment, but just make sure everything's okay at this point. Questions about the definition? Um, <clears throat> so. Let me kind of draw um, some kind of quote unquote pictures real quick. So first is gonna be the case when G check is equal to GM that I described before. So then the way this looks as GM restricted looks um, is it's gonna be a disjoint union, you know, genuine sort of, I really mean disjoint union over all stigma or rank one, um, least chief, on X, um, there's going to be some sigma here. And sort of the picture um, is going to be that this locus GM sigma restricted um, is the formal completion. I, OK, I'm writing picture twice, but OK. And uh, the sort of uh, true um, non-existent um, moduli space of GM local systems. So, uh, so this is, I should say, a precise statement. If I took my sheaves to be D modules, if I passed back to the D module situation, um, I should say that there's a, a discrepancy between maybe these two things that I wrote down here. One is about Lee's sheaves, even in the D module situation, that's different from this whole category of D modules. And so I get something much more restrictive if I take that definition. And what I'll end up with is, you know, this is a precise statement. It'll be the disjoint union of formal completions over all, um, over all K points of the stack. <clears throat> um, uh, and a, another way to say this is that just, you know, the, the geometry here, it's gonna, um, it's gonna look exactly like, like you think in terms of tangent spaces and so on. Um, in the general situation. So they're controlled by um, the cohomology. Uh, so I'm going to take a sort of second case, which is slightly illegal in my notation, but if my group is GM, sorry, my group is GA. So in this case, uh, locus uh, GA restricted. So of course, and it's, not, can't, it's not a reductive group. It can't be G check, but the definition still makes sense. Um, so in this case, this is equal to this, so to say, equals the true space of GA local systems. Um, so again, it's for instance in the D module situation. Um, and the basic picture here is that um, the way it looks uh, is that there's going to be a stack BGA around. Um, there's going to be a vector space that's H1 of X with QL bar coefficients. Oops. Um, and so let's say et al. Um, and then there's going to be some kind of a little bit derivedness about um, H2. <clears throat> um, and so basically it's a vector space. Uh, and in particular, it's not some formal thing. So here, everything is just a bunch of formal points. In this GA case, you get something like uh, big. It's just as big as in the drum situation. It's genuine, you know, sort of genuinely positive dimensional. Um, um, and now let me just somehow say uh, for general G check, uh, the space looks as G check restricted. It's going to break up um, <clears throat> somehow. Similarly, so it's going to break up over a disjoint union of pairs, um, maybe I should say M check, comma sigma, of some components. 
Um, maybe write M check from a sigma. And this is mod equivalence, where M check is a levy of G check. Um, sigma is, um, <clears throat> is a semi simple um, M check local system. X um, and uh, and sort of the again the same sort of picture is going to be that the space looks as G check restricted um, and check sigma is the formal completion of the space of true um, looks as G check along the locus. Oops. Look. Locus of local systems with some simplification um, sigma. <clears throat> um, so, in other words, kind of the space locus G check restricted around an irreducible local system, for instance, it just looks like a fat point again. Um, it's uh, there's sort of no kind of genuine algebraic geometry that's happening with it. But around uh, reducible local systems, the geometry gets much more complicated. For instance, you can see phenomena, um, you know, like what's happening for GA here around, say, the trivial local system for GL2. <clears throat> um, by just mapping GA to GM or GL2 in a usual way. Sorry, when you say the locus of local systems with semi simplification sigma, these are M check local systems? Uh, no, G check local systems. So if you think like uh, GL2, for instance, so uh, here I could have kind of two sorts of data for my semi simple local systems. One would be uh, I could either have just a pair of rank one local systems, or I could have an irreducible rank two local system. And if I have a local system that's not irreducible, it has some semi-simplification, which will be that pair sigma one, sigma two, two right. yeah. of, of rank one local systems. Um, and yeah, there's sort of a lot baked into like mod equivalence and so on, but that's, um, that's the idea. Thank you. Um, and yeah, and the, the locus of reducible local systems will be closed and so on instead of the whole space. The formal completions are well behaved. Um, oops, not four. <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, um, so sort of kind of precise statement. So all of this, I mean, what I was saying here, it's a it's a picture, but there's a um, precise statement, which is that. Um, so one of the theorems from our paper is that. Uh, the space locus G check restricted um, is um, is an an in Artin stack um, and so to say uh, kind of maybe up to a cover. Um, so the precise statement is, is slightly uh, involved, but um, essentially for all practical practical purposes, um, every component, um, every connected component um, looks like a formal completion of one iron stack and another. Can so I ask a question? Yeah. Is a semi simplification just some kind of reduction of the structure group? I, I don't really understand what that is. Um, so being, yeah, so I was uh, trying to be a little bit um, informal about it here, but uh, yeah, so being um, irreducible in this context means that you reduce to some parabolic. And if you, uh, you know, reduce to a parabolic, you can then reduce further to the corresponding levy. Um, and that's what the semi simplification would be in that context. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, for sort of a minimal choice of, of such data. 
Um, yeah, or, yeah, maybe a. Yeah, yeah. Stick with that. Um, okay, so the geometry, yeah, I, I should say in particular, the geometry is sort of finite yeah. dimensional. So that's that's what this means. So kind of the slogan um, is that it can be described using finite dimensional geometry, which you would expect from the kind of picture I said. Oh, sorry, just to make sure I understand the elementary statement, right? What, what you said just now, reducible means it can be reduced, uh, that the structure group can be reduced to a parabolic, but semi-simplification is push out to a levy, not reduction to a levy, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, and, and uh, but, but it, of course, you know, you could, you could do that in a wrong way, right? So, um, for instance, you shouldn't take your parabolic to be G check if you want to call that the semi simplification. So um, you could think of, of a sort of minimal parabolic for which the local system admits a reduction, yeah. or equivalently, you can say, well, you can define irreducible local system the way I said, and then semi simple local system is just the same as irreducible for, um, for this uh, M check according to the definition I gave. And the assertion is that up to this equivalence, um, you admit, well, so to say, a unique semi-simplification, a unique data where if you reduce to the parabolic, unique up to conjugacy and so on, data where you reduce to the parabolic, project down to the levy, you're going to get something irreducible. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so now I can um, essentially formulate our conjecture. So, um, so this is the sort of um, what we call restricted geometric Langlands conjecture um, or categorical geometric Langlands conjecture. And what it says is that um, the category of sheaves with some notation I should explain in a second on the space of, so this is, these are inconstructible sheaves with uh, I'll say nilpotent singular support in the moment um, on the space of G bundles um, is equivalent this category of inco coherent sheaves with uh, no potent kind of higher singular support on the space of G check restricted local systems. So both of these are categories, um, you know, linear over QL bar. Um, let me know. Um, so, uh, so first of all, the remark. Okay, obviously this side, uh, I should say, it's given exactly the same definition as in the um, Durham setting. I ignored it, but uh, again, it's some just variant on quasi-coherent sheaves. Um, this uh, condition on nilpotence, so or on the left-hand side, um, so this category of sheaves with nilpotent singular support inside of sheaves is the subcategory of sheaves um, with singular support um, in what's called um, the global nilpotent cone inside of the cotangent space of 1G. So um, <clears throat> maybe I'll just say kind of very briefly a few words about this. So um, a kind of exercise say for G equals GLN um, is that this cotangent space of bun G is going to be the set of rank n vector bundles and a map um, from what's called the Higgs field um, like this. And this nilpotent locus um, is where, um, you know, raise phi to a high, high enough power and you should get zero as expected. <clears throat> um, so that's just what this nilp is. So natural generalization for arbitrary um, arbitrary groups. Uh, second, this singular support um, 
um, what is it? So kind of heuristically, um, it like for a sheaf on some maybe stack Y, uh, it's singular support F is something contained inside of the cotangent bundle of this Y and it describes the directions Um, in which um, you can parallel transport sections of F. So basically, if you imagine you have a point and you have a vector, uh, so this is, I mean, it's a little bit informal, but basically if you have a point and a vector, you want to say that uh, you can transport a section at this point in that direction, exactly when that, that vector pairs with every element in the singular support to give you a zero. Um, so um, yeah, so that's just about all I want to say, but so just sort of for example, singular support of F um, is equal to the zero section um, exactly when the chief F is a local system. And um, last thing, oh, not last thing, there's gonna be more. Um, so the singular support in the etal setting um, was defined um, a few years ago by Balenson. Um, Another thing is that the appearance of this category sheaves nilp um, on bungee is reminiscent of um, the Betty Langlands conjectures. Of, um, of my colleague Ben Zvi um, and David Nadler. And uh, yeah, I should say again, the conjecture, well, there should be many structures that should preserve Hecke functors and, and so on. Um, <clears throat> I can add it's true for GM. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that's what I had. Um, so that's the statement of the conjecture. Um, maybe I, um, oh, maybe just one other thing to say that um, in the, this subset nilp inside of the cotangent bundle of one G um, is the Grangian by um, a theorem of Ginsburg. Um, so our, um, our conjecture in the D module situation, you know, it only concerns holonomic D modules. Um, so being holonomic, a D module being holonomic exactly means that it's singular support is the Grangian um, in the D module situation. So that, that kind of addresses one of the concerns we had when we looked at the valence and Drinfeld conjecture and wanted to generalize it. Um, and uh, let me maybe just kind of make um, one, uh, one remark. I guess it's true for G equals GM um, or um, X equals P1. Um, and uh, maybe I'll... Um, sorry, would the uh, holonomic D modules in the periodic setting make sense as this category is really not well behaved? Um, well, so 
Uh, I'm so. What do you mean? Uh, so Piatic, do you mean Eladic here? What I'm calling Eladic. Yeah, Eladic. So, so the nature of the sheaves is it's sort of very different. So um, these D modules again, they have the flavor of like vector bundles with connection, but you allow these big ones that are um, maybe not not vector bundles, um, not local. Yeah. And, and the other hand, in the the tal setting is much more analogous. These Eladic constructible sheaves I'm talking about, they're much more analogous to um, you know, sheaves constructible uh, for the complex topology. So, uh, so they're somehow, they're a different flavor. And when you think in terms of sheaves for the complex topology, you know, for instance, local systems are gonna be the same as vector bundles with flat connection. Um, but, but when you try to find things analogous to like the sheaf of differential operators or some big object like that, it doesn't really have a, a counterpart. In the, in the Betty theory. And that's kind of, uh, it can be made precise in a lot of ways, but really the guys that have topological or a tall counterparts are automatically holonomic. Anything non-holonomic is just, it's off the table. So in our situation of arbitrary sheaf theory, there's not an, an analog of a non-holonomic object, object, which is related to the fact that there's not any other version of the space of local systems that you can conceive of. Um, sorry, but uh, I, I think I'm missing something elementary. Why do you want non-holonomic objects? Uh, uh, well, the, I, I, you mean in this, like right now? Right. Or, or is the, are you saying that you want non I, I missed what you said. No. So uh, like, why did I write this statement or something? So one of the issues is that um, the, so if you try to think just you know, I don't know. I remember as a, as a grad student trying to think like, what, what could this geometric Langlands conjecture say for, um, you know, allotic sheaves for automorphic forms? I'm sure, um, you know, other people. Well, um, I guess I'm just trying well, to- I, I, Well, let, let, maybe I can just finish to answer the question. So, sure. so the issue is that by its nature, just everything about it, it's hugely non-holonomic. In the case of GM or something like this, you can't do it without non-holonomic D modules. And so when you try to think what should be the Eladic counterpart, one of the problems you run into is that there's no analog of a non-holonomic etal sheaf. And so you're trying to take a conjecture that is inherently non-holonomic and transport it essentially into the holonomic situation and then start running analogies. And so here, this is a positive feature of our, of our I'm just saying that this is how this accounts for that objection. Um, everything that's appearing, even in the D-module situation is already holonomic um, in our version of the conjecture. Okay, so, so you are looking at holonomic D-modules. Yeah, in our conjecture, in the D, in our version of the conjecture for the D-module situation, um, it, yeah. And, and is that category of holonomic D-modules over LADX, uh, like, well-behaved in terms of, like, push forwards and so on, like, functorially? Um, uh, wait, what sort of push forwards do you want? Just push forward of a holonomic D-module if it's still holonomic, for example. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all D-module operations preserve holonomic things. Yep. Sorry, okay, okay. Bit, I'm not getting confused. So here in the Eladic setting as well, there's a perfectly well-defined theory of perverse shapes, right? That's the holonomic case, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. But well, here we're considering drive categories, so I don't really care about the difference between constructible and perverse, but right. for finer questions, you would. But you want something larger, that's what you're saying, because uh, over C, you need something larger. So that was, is that what roughly the correct statement? Yeah, that's roughly the picture. So basically, if you want to try to, um, you know, it, it's, it's the sort of following situation. So it's kind of the usual geometric Langlands conjecture describes something that seems, well, that's much bigger than holonomic D modules. Uh, so therefore much larger than what's analogous to what you have in characteristic P. So you could imagine two possible solutions to this problem. One would be enlarging somehow the category of etal sheaves or constructible sheaves to include non-holonomic objects. That's kind of a non-starter. Um, and then there's something else you could imagine doing, which is shrinking both sides of the conjecture. And so uh, what we've explained here is how to shrink both sides of the conjecture so that it makes sense in an arbitrary setting. So uh, oh, okay. So we shrink by putting this null potence of singular support um, condition in, and uh, and it forces everything to be holonomic as as stated here. So therefore, somehow the analogy, the problem with the analogy goes away. And uh, how should you shrink the right hand side? Well, you should use restricted local systems. 
I rather see. than arbitrary and local systems. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I've had it now. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, and there's a question here. Um, why do we use least sheaves instead of constructible sheaves? I think if you defined it with constructible sheaves, you would get, you would only see these objects ever appearing. Um, I, didn't, I mean, the real answer is because they're supposed to be local systems. And so um, that's the, uh, that's the real answer, like local systems are least sheaves. And so, um, yeah. Um, so maybe I can just, uh, maybe I'll kind of, uh, let's see, how do I uh, want to conclude here? So I guess I can say uh, kind of one, a couple of other pieces of evidence. So. Um, I think next time, um, um, Nick will, I believe, um, explain some parts of the following theorem. Um, um, which is that uh, there's, so, um, it says that this category of quasi-coherent sheaves on locus G check restricted acts on the category oops, of sheaves with um, no potent singular support on bun G <coughs> um, compatibly with Hecke functors. Sort of like as in the earlier discussion. So um, to remark that um, in the D module situation, um, the analogous results, I should say that's of course predicted by, um, by our conjecture. So in the D module situation, the analogous result um, is a theorem of gate scores. Um, with a much harder proof. Um, so one of the happy features of, of our work is that it's kind of set up exactly to um, prove such a theorem. And, um, and now maybe I'll say something kind of uh, that looks a little bit unrelated, but I just sort of want to say um, there's another maybe big ingredient of our work so uh, kind of a second comment. So a big ingredient for this theorem, well, it kind of appears all over the place. So uh, just a, another, I, I hope it feels motivated. So, um, so kind of there's, there are good features of, of this nilpotence of singular support. Um, so, so there's kind of an old heuristic of, of Lamone a long time ago that all Hecke eigensheaves should have nilpotent singular support, which is something, well, it's actually an outcome of, of our work. Um, <clears throat> the, and, and so there's some kind of motivation for people who are in the subject for considering this, this nilp condition. Um, I, you know, certainly that was in the minds of um, Bedensby and Nadler in, in their situation. But there's some kind of precise things you can say that uh, might make someone feel a little bit more comfortable if they're seeing it for the first time. So I can sort of say properly, um, Hecke functors um, in um, geometric Langlands take the following form. So uh, one thing you can do is you can take a representation of G check and that's gonna give for you um, a functor sheaves on bun G to sheaves on this curve times bun G. So I said before that V really gives you a functor from sheaves, V and a choice of point give you a functor from, um, from uh, 
sheaves on bun G to sheaves on bun G, that's just the fiber, you know, at your fixed point of this sort of better functor I'm writing. So this is sort of um, Hecke functors with a moving point. Um, and there's something more general that um, will be used in the future talks, which is that if you have I a finite set and a representation of this group um, G check to the I, which is basically an I tuple of, of uh, representations, at least if it's irreducible, um, then you can uh, construct a corresponding Hecke functor with moving and sort of colliding points. So if you sort of imagine doing this, like taking the fiber at two, let's say I is a set with two elements, uh, it'll be sort of like apply the Hecke functor at this point or at this point. Um, and if you imagine the points coming together, it'll be like apply the Hecke functors in either order. They commute, so it doesn't matter. <clears throat> um, so, so this is, I should say, Hecke functors with moving points. Um, and so the special property is that um, if you have an object, well, we all call this H um, of H sub V. So special property is that H sub V maps this category of sheaves with nullpotent and singular support into the category of Lee's sheaves on um, X to the I um, tensor in my earlier categorical sense, sheaves nilp of bungee. Um, so this is a theorem of nadler yun Um, and, and it, what it says, you know, first of all, is that, so it's not, it's not a hard thing to see from the definitions, but that if you apply Hecke functors to this category with nilpotent singular support, uh, it's preserved under Hecke functors. But somehow more seriously, if you vary your point, you end up with a local system along the curve factor. Um, and somehow more seriously than, and that even, well, oops. is that it's built out of, um, okay, you end up with a local system along this curve factor. Let me leave it there. And then there's um, a converse. Um, so let's say for i equals one, um, so let's say conversely, let's just say i equals one, and suppose you have some sheaf on bun G um, such that uh, the Hecke functor of F is in the least sheaf on X tensor with sheaves on bun G um, for every V representation. Um, that implies that uh, F actually secretly lived in this category of sheaves with no point and singular support. Um, and so this is um, this is a theorem of ours. Um, and so the kind of upshot um, is that uh, you know, so to say, no potence of singular support um, is actually equivalent to saying that um, Hecke functors. Uh, are locally constant along the curve, well, heuristically. Um, so that's, you know, that's starting to get at this uh, picture of these, it's starting to make the connection between no potence of singular support and the space of restricted local systems. For instance, Lee's sheaves appears on, on both sides. And so I think next time, uh, Nick will probably continue along this uh, this line of thought and uh, and also start to talk about what happens when you really start working over finite fields and considering you know the action of Frobenius.
So I think that's all I've got to say. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, maybe I could ask a quick question before opening it up to others. Um, could you just say very briefly how your conjecture about this equivalence, uh, uh, how it relates to the classical geometric language of Lafargue down? Of, of um, wait, which version of geometric language do you want here? Just uh, want to... say uh, uh, Lafargue's version. Uh, so that that um, that is part of the subject, not of this talk, but of the next two talks. I would okay. say. Yeah. So, um, so what we're what we're going to do, I guess I, I should say. So um, maybe kind of very classically, there's this idea that if you have an aladic, if you have a variety over a finite field, and you have an aladic sheaf on it, there's a function attached to it. And the major thing to know is that that function is obtained by taking a trace of Frobenius. Right. And so what we're going to explain, or what not me, but what my uh, collaborators will explain is that if you take, there's, there's a notion of trace of Frobenius, well, trace of an endomorphism also in the setting of drive categories. And uh, if you, and so in our conjecture, um, there's, there are Frobenius operators on both sides and you can take the trace of Frobenius in this categorical sense. And if you do this, then you end up with a statement describing all automorphic functions, um, unramified, compactly supported, um, in terms of Langland's dual data. Um, so that's what I think will be the, you know, the sort of point of, of Dennis's talk. And if you um, play that sort of game with, um, with uh, for instance, this theorem, this kind of decomposition. Um, so what we'll see eventually is that if you take the trace of Frobenius on this side, you exactly recover automorphic functions. And if you take the trace of Frobenius of this construction, you recover actually a refinement um, of, of uh, Vincent Laforgue's uh, uh, main main results in a more general kind of set, well more and less general setting, um, so we can I guess we can also recover a, a version of his results. We can refine his results um, in the ramified situation as well. But here I'm talking um, unramified. But the basic picture is that what Vincent Lefort gives is a decomposition of cusp forms um, over the space of Langlands parameters. And what we'll see here is that uh, in a certain precise sense, the whole space of compactly supported automorphic forms decomposes over, um, over a stack parameterizing arithmetic local systems. So parameterizing, I should say, uh, uh, vague local systems. I see. That's kind of the nature of, of our uh, result. And yeah, extending what he did. Uh, it also uses his work as input, I should add. Thank you. Well, as I was saying, normally at this point, we just uh, pass freely into questions. So any, uh, anybody else who, who has questions can just jump in. And... May I have a comment? I was um, uh, also a justification for looking at uh, singular support over nil p. In terms of quantization, uh, it makes complete sense because over there, there's this uh, thing called the Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization. And uh, for that, you look at uh, Lagrangian submanifolds of your uh, phase space, and you look at functions which are uh, restricted, I mean, functions which are just supported on that Lagrangian, and that becomes your Hilbert space. So it, uh, I mean, in terms of quantization, just to restrict to a Lagrangian subspace makes uh, a lot of sense. It's a natural thing to do. And uh, so a question is that uh, physics uh, also gives you um, a lot of different uh, Lagrangians in this, uh, uh, well, I definitely know that they give you a lot of different Lagrangians in the moduli space of Higgs bundles, and I'm hoping they uh, go all the way to um, uh, in the stack uh, bungee as well, well, cotangent uh, space of bungee as well. So one of them is, for example, these, if you're looking at for SL2, if you look at uh, all the Higgs bundles, which are SL2R, that would give you a, uh, a Lagrangian subspace. And there's another thing that uh, it's called the Witten section. He basically gave... Uh, uh, a section from the Hitchin base to the total space. So the image of that gave you a Lagrangian. I'm wondering if you've uh, looked at uh, these, uh, if you've looked at sheaves which are holonomic but have support not on the global nilpotent cone, but uh, some other Lagrangian. And for that, you can also formulate or try to formulate a similar kind of uh, Langlands correspondence. Um, also, as you pointed out, in that case, the I, well, 
um, so the 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 form the um, the modules that you will get, which are holonomic, but with support on some other uh, Lagrangian uh, variety, will not be Hecke eigen because your th theorem uh, says so. So that's I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm just wondering if other Lagrangians have been considered. Um, yeah. So the the situation of, for instance, SL two R or something like this certainly uh, doesn't make sense in the algebraic context. Um, the uh, yeah, as far as I um, yeah, and I'm not aware of um, of anything concerning this uh, this constant kind of constant or Witten or whatever section of the pigeon oh. eighth. And um, so, and I have a, so uh, do you have an analog for uh, Eisenstein series in this case or Eisenstein forms? So things that usually come from cusps or boundaries. Yes, yeah. I mean, in usual geometric line lens, there's, um, well, there are kind of a couple different flavors of Eisenstein functors. And um, yeah, they, they preserve these relevant categories. Steve's nope. I see. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. In some sense, like on, on the spectral side, actually, Eisenstein series also kind of makes sense. And um, this definition of end code nope, in some way, it's, it's, um, it's actually rigged um, exactly to sort of be compatible with that Eisenstein series operation. Makes sense. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. But, yeah, Sam, Sam, I have a vague question. Um, so, so you started out by explaining that like Loxis has all these sort of bad properties in the, uh, or, or we can't really make sense of the true Loxis or in, in some sense in this Atlantic setting. And, you know, when I thought about this before, before your guys' work, I sort of thought that to make progress in this area, you'd have to kind of solve that problem. But it, you're basically saying it seems like you just take what there is, this locus is restricted, and just interpret it literally, and you get something. Um, I'm kind of wondering, is there any sense in which you're missing something from the fact that you don't really see the kind of true topology on the space of semi-simple local systems? Or, I mean, can you... Admittedly, I don't know how to make sense of what the true topology is, nor or what the true local systems is, but we can say over the complex numbers. And I, I'm just wondering if you see sort of hints that something is missing. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, well, uh, I I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I don't know something to that effect. So I can say a couple maybe different. So I, I think that this picture uh, should be regarded as pretty satisfying um, in some ways in the Eladic situation. It's different than the usual geometric Lang lens conjecture. Like already, it makes sense for the D-module situation. It produces a different conjecture. Oh, that was the other piece of evidence I meant to say. In the D-module situation, you can show that our restricted conjecture is equivalent to the, um, the full D-module conjecture. Non-obvious statement, but that's, that's one of the results in our form paper. Um, <clears throat> So maybe that's a, an aside, but um, but there's, I guess, um, you know, of course you could say the presence of sheaves that don't have null potent singular support is a sign. I mean, that's the, somehow the sign of something that's missing. But on the other hand, uh, for like a, um, a working person in some ways, like a number theorist or something like this for solving the problem I stated in the beginning, um, what we ultimately end up showing is, well, sort of in a precise sense, every uh, you know, unramified automorphic function comes as the trace of Frobenius of some sheaf on, with no potent singular support on Bungie. And moreover, you know, what these future talks are going to explain is that kind of, you know, uh, if you imagine dealing with the whole category of sheaves, you could represent a function in many possible ways, right? So for instance, if you take a sky, you take your abelian variety, your Jacobian, you take a skyscraper sheaf at the origin, it's kind of the sum of the characters, but also it's like the function attached to 
a skyscraper sheaf at the origin. And what we show is that if you only allow yourself sheaves with milk and singular support, which is like only considering local systems, all relations between these functions have categorical origins. Um, and so that kind of cutting things down, it, it's a very, um, uh, well, from the, from the perspective of automorphic functions, it's a convenient thing to do. This, this is the guy that gives you automorphic functions on the nose um, and, not, and not something, for instance, bigger. Like the trace of Frobenius on all sheaves is too big for the reason I just said. Yeah, I, I see. I, I guess I was expecting something, I mean, you might see something at a kind of functional analytic level in the sense that like if I had some continuous space and I just treated it as a discrete space and then tried to look at functions on it, I might not get the kind of function space that I wanted to consider, you know, like L2 functions if I just sort of discretized my space. Uh, I, I couldn't make sense of that. Uh, I, I guess I'm wondering if you, you, you see something to this effect in your kind of, you know, when you, you're taking trace of Frobenius. I don't know yeah, what we, I'm getting at. Yeah, we, we haven't uh, encountered anything to that effect so far. So again, somehow, mm -hmm. for instance, you know, again, if you, well, I okay, lost the page, but this spectral decomposition theorem, you know, what it says is that um, the whole category, like the category of sheaves with no potent singular support only decomposes over the space with fixed, you know, semi-simplifications um, already in the demodule situation. And so, um, so that's some, some sign that once you're working with sheaves with no potent singular support, there's not, you're not running into those kinds of issues. It, it's not secretly decomposing over something bigger. It's, you know, yeah. also decomposes over this bigger thing, but it's somehow supported on, on these low side that we care about. And yeah, for the automorphic theory, you know, again, precise statement is that Teresa de Frobenius exactly recovers automorphic forms. Um, you know, it, it somehow, and, and that's, again, it's kind of a feature of, of cutting things down. Again, for just an abelian variety, you can recover a function in, in multiple ways. Um, but from a sheaf. But in a precise sense, if you only allow yourself these sheaves, you can recover every function, but in an essentially unique way, up to you know short exact sequences and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I okay, yeah, I see. Yeah, I I I have another another question. A thing I've I've had in mind is that uh, um, you know over the complex numbers you talked about, you compared it with the Durham setting, but as you said, there's also the sort of Benz v. Nadler style Betty setting, which to me is sort of different in the sense that it doesn't just use the profinite et al. homotopy type of the curve, but the sort of full analytic homotopy type. We can consider infinite rank local systems Absolutely, yeah. that are not profinite. Uh, and so you could still say that, you know, so th those are sheaves with nil potent singular support, but they're not, they're like, you know, not not with finite stalks. Yeah, they're not constructible. Yeah. They're not constructible in that sense. Um, yeah, do you see, uh, I don't know, yeah, from, from that perspective then like the, the, there's another class of big objects that you might hope to consider. And uh, I could also ask the same thing, like do you, I, I don't know, I guess they don't appear that you can't take the trace of such objects naturally. So I, I don't know that they would appear as automorphic functions. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I guess I was wondering if, if yeah, <clears throat> yeah, you would so, hope to. I mean, at, at a technical level, a lot of the proofs reduce to kind of analysis of those Betty local system spaces. Um, they're like, they were very um, instructive in our work um, as, a, as an example, but yeah, again, it's some, it's somehow like one of the miracles of this restricted local systems actually is that like, if you're over C, it has canonical maps to Durham loxus and to Betty loxus, just cause you know, that's what Riemann Hilbert says. It's like, mm -hmm. these sheaves are the same in either setting. Um, Can you prove the, the big Betty thing, can you prove that that's implied by your conjecture in the same way that the big Durham one is? Uh, uh, I didn't think about it. So 
Um, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, but in, but in some sense, actually, what you end up with at the end of the day, it's it's not exactly written in the paper, and probably there's some. I, I I don't think the logic is totally spelled out, but what you end up with is essentially that the Betty one, the Betty conjecture, on the other hand, would imply our restricted version, um, which then would imply it would almost right. imply the drum thing. It would imply you know the restricted conjecture over C, whereas the restricted conjecture over every field, um, which should be you know roughly the same as right. Right. gives the Durham one. So it kind of it means there's some approach to this Durham situation using genuine genuine sort of topology, pairs of pants and so on. Right, right. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. Thanks thanks for indulging my questions. <laughs> in your conjecture, when you say equivalence of categories, does it mean derived categories of bounded yeah. derived or no it's yeah it's unbounded. It's unbounded derived categories. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and uh, yeah. And it's it's normal derived, so it's not something strange. Good. Well, uh, I, I mean, strange is such a okay. So, uh, I, I guess first of all, there's like a there's a stylistic thing, which is that um, here we usually. Uh, well, because we have to consider these kinds of higher symmetries and so on, uh, should consider things as DG categories or some kind of um, version, you know, something amenable to basically infinity categorical techniques or homotopical techniques. Um, right. So some, sometimes that's considered strange. But the other thing is that this locus, um, the space of local systems, I said, is um, it's a derived, it's an object of derived algebraic geometry. So. Um, that might not be the case if the genus is at least two, um, but it's probably not the case, but uh, at least in these, in genus one or something like this. Um, oh yeah, and if the group is adjoint, but but that that derived structure, it changes a little bit what you mean by coherent sheaves. Um, you know, it's like you think about the category of modules over a ring versus the modules over some DG ring that has that, your given ring is it's H zero, it's that kind of thing. So. So it's not the derived, so like um, that side won't be the derived category of the abelian category, for instance. All right. That kind of thing is, is coming in. Um, yeah, and similarly, like sheaves on Bungi, it, it's like an equivariant derived category. Right. So um, similarly. Thanks for a great talk. Sure, thanks. So I have a, like, a, a question. Is there a, and so I'm just trying to convert classical uh, theorems into conjectures in this uh, geometric setting. Is there a, so is there an analog for the Ramanujan Peterson uh, conjecture for uh, these D modules or these uh, automorphic forms in this geometric setting? It's it's a um, it's a reasonable question, but not not that I'm aware of. Um, so yeah, so I mean that kind of thing. Um, I mean for GLN, at least it's known by um, by Laurent Lefort's work. Um, it it actually goes in as a, a step of. Um, one of our arguments at some point. Um, and yeah, I, I should think, but I'm, I'm not a, okay. I, yeah, it's a, it's, I'm, I'm not aware of, of any. Um, Never mind. Sure. Never another. Like it's, it, this is, there's just, sorry, I'm gonna just, because there are less people and it wouldn't strain the internet now or the connection. 
Um, so over C, you have these uh, geometric Hecke operators on uh, Bungie. That's basically given by choosing a point and looking at a torsion sheaves, which are uh, uh, modifications. Yeah, I mean, it's a standard thing. So I don't, but over C, so do you have an analog of these operators on uh, the Berry side, on the, on the local system side? Uh, uh, so, so the, so like, let's say you're doing GLN and, um, and you're, uh, yeah, you're doing this kind of simplest version of modifications, for instance, mm -hmm. um, at some point. So your point defines for you a vector bundle on Loxus GLN, right? Namely just like, it's kind of, it's, it's fiber at a point is like the fiber of your local system at that point. Okay, skyscraper chief, basically. It's not a skyscraper chief, it's a, vect it's a vector bundle. So it's sort of like for every, every time you have a local system, you get some n-dimensional vector space out of it, right? Which is like the fiber of that local system at your fixed point. Um, and so, so that defines for you a vector bundle on this locus GLN and uh, therefore an endofunctor, which is tensoring by this vector bundle. I see. So that's that's what's supposed to match to the Sekai operator under um, under geometric lens. I see. Yeah. By the way, can one think of Hecke modification in terms of uh, coverings of the curve? That uh, so you have a curve and you choose a point and you basically look at two sheaves which are Hecke modified by this uh, torsion sheaf. Can one say that there exists a covering of your base curve? Um, such that when you pull back both the sheaf and its modified sheaf upstairs, they become isomorphic. And somehow the order of the degree has to do with the, the torsion order. So basically the torsion thing of the, of the sheaf turns into the, the deck transformation and it acts on a sheaf upstairs and you look at the descent. And uh, maybe that's how you can uh, modify the thing. No, I'm not aware of any such thing. It doesn't, yeah. Just brainstorming. <laughs> Thanks. It was uh, very enjoyable. Me too. Thank Thanks. you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you.